we've arrived in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. This is a big one. This chapter here is a big chapter. Again, initially, when I first saw it and read through it, I was thinking to myself, hmm, I could probably do this whole entire chapter. But as I began to dissect it and study it and go through it, I was like, I I can't. It's going to take me probably another week or so to to complete. So, again, this is one of those chapters where you're going to have to be really patient here, and we're not going to try to rush through it because it's it's a lot of great stuff here that we can learn from. And so, again, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 11, and I've titled today's message, Walk in the Certainty of of faith. Walk in the certainty of faith. Now, in in writing his epistles, Paul's typical method at the outset was to address issues of doctrine and to follow them up with exhortations to duty. He would talk about a position who we are in Christ before he would deal with practice, how we should live and behave. And such is the case here now in this letter to the Hebrews. Now, the first 10 chapters have uh, have been, um, were in regards to doctrine, position, and what Christ has done for us. Well, in the remaining three chapters the author will make practical application. In fact, each of the three remaining chapters, he will address one of the three great virtues. In chapter 11, we're going to read here about the walk of faith. In chapter 12, we're going to be reminded of the wisdom of hope. And in chapter 13, we're going to read about... uh, Well, we're going to see a way of love. Now, it's not the author. It's not that the author of this letter is suddenly saying, okay, now we're done with doctrine. So let's switch gears and talk about something practical. No. See, it all flows together. It all meshes. It all is going the same direction. Now, keep in mind that This epistle, this letter to the Hebrews was written to keep Jewish believers from being sucked back into religious traditions. That's why chapter 11 is so essential to the discussion of the first 10 chapters. I know it's tempting to go back to that which you can see with your eyes, smell with your nose, and touch with your hands. But don't do it, the author pleads. For now, you are called to something entirely different. You are called, my friends, my fellow believers, to walk by faith. Now, in today's passage specifically, the author will describe what faith does and how to live how to live our lives of faith, how to live lives of faith according to the pattern seen by those who by faith were faithful to God in in their earthly pilgrimages. And so today's message will show you, we'll be talking a lot about faith. If you've ever wondered what faith is, well, today's passage will maybe answer that question for you. Now, there are a lot of, type, there are a lot of types of faith. You know, people, everybody, everyone believes in, stuff, in something. And so what we're going to be talking about here this morning, today, is specifically about biblical faith. It's going to show you what biblical faith is by giving you some great Old Testament examples real-life examples in order to challenge you so you may walk by faith just as they did. 
And so before we get into this chapter, let's come to God once again and ask Him to bless us as we dig into His Word. Lord God, I pray that right now, that as we open Your Word, as we begin to read Your wonderful, beautiful Word, that You will speak powerfully through it, Lord. That You will use the words we're about to read to encourage us and to convict us in those areas that may cause us to either stumble or cause us to, 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 to not be as intimate with you as we ought to be, Lord. Lord, this topic of faith is, is so important. And it's important because there's so much that you want to teach us about it, about it, Lord. And that's why you've given us so many examples throughout your entire, entire word to show us. So now, again, remove all distractions. May we just humbly sit before you as we read your word and, and use me, Lord God, to speak your truth. Keep us safe here, Lord, and watch over, over us. Fill this room with your spirit. Pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. The Word of God says in verse 1, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For by it our ancestors won God's approval. Yes, I'm stopping there because there's a lot to unpack just in those two verses. Now, in the final section of chapter 10 that we covered last week, the author of Hebrews reminded his Christian readers to hold on to the confidence of the great reward that they'll receive and encouraged them to endure in the face of persecution. And then he ended that section there by saying, we are not those who draw back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and are saved. Well, here now, in this new section that we're beginning, he describes what faith does and what it looks like. Now, the writer says in verse 1 that faith is the reality of what is hoped for the proof of what is not seen. Again, read that to yourselves silently again. And let those words sink in. Now, as they do, as you can see, there's a two-part description of faith here. Number one, the reality of what is hoped for. And number two, the proof of what is not seen. Now, before I get into detail, more detail about those two, that two-part description, I think it's important, I think it's necessary to first tell you what biblical, what biblical faith is and what it isn't. Let me begin by telling you what it isn't. True biblical faith isn't blind optimism or a manufactured hope-so feeling. It isn't also, it isn't obtaining a higher knowledge of doctrine than others, nor is it believing in spite of evidence. That would be superstition. Quoting the famous evangelist George Mueller, he said, Faith does not operate in the realm 
in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. True biblical faith, my friends, is confident obedience to God's word in spite of the circumstances and and consequences. Again, quoting George Mueller, he said this, Faith is the assurance that the thing which God has said in his word is true and that God will act according to what he has said in his word. Faith is not a matter of impressions, nor of probabilities, nor of appearances. And so simply put, church, faith is is the unquestionable belief in what God has said and acting on it in spite of what reason or logic may say. And here's how it operates. Here's how faith operates. God speaks and we hear his word. We trust his word and act on it regardless of the, again, the circumstances or the consequences. Yes, often the circumstances may be impossible and the consequences frightening and unknown, but faith will move us to obey regardless of all that. Why? Because God is good. God is good and his plans and purposes are perfect. Okay, now, breaking down verse 1. In the first part of that verse, we're told that faith is a reality of what is hoped for. The idea behind this phrase is having a solid, a solid certainty in the future promises of God, even though those promises haven't yet been fulfilled. Now, as believers, here are some of the promises Here are some of the things we hope for. We hope for Christ's return. In Titus 2.13, it says, For the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Number two, we hope for the resurrection. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Number three, we hope for glorification. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 say, We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And number four, we hope to reign with him. For if we endure, we will also reign with him. And Revelation chapter 22, verse 5 says, Night will be no more. People will not need the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. And so again, the hope of Christ's return, the hope for resurrection, the hope for glorification, and the hope to reign with him, those, those things, those as believers are some of the things that we hope for. Well, now that, again, we know that faith is a solid certainty of what's to come, the second part of verse 1 also describes faith as the proof of what is not Seen. Now here, I want you to follow me closely because it can get confusing. What the author is saying here is that faith provides an unshakable evidence that the unseen spiritual blessings of Christianity are absolutely certain and real. 
In other words, this two-part description of faith brings the future within the present. And it enables us to believe in the invisible spiritual kingdom that's around us. If you never heard that before, let me, let me explain. If you weren't aware, if you didn't know, there truly is an active spiritual realm all around us, an unseen spiritual realm all around us. The Bible does mention this. I believe that if we could all see it, if we could all see what's really going on outside our visual plane, outside our, this realm here, I believe that, man, it would radically change lives in an instant. If you could see spiritual warfare going on between the demonic forces of the devil and the angelic forces of the Lord, you will, again, it, it just would floor you. But here's the thing, but here's the thing about it though. We can see it and we do see it. See, faith proves that there's more than what our physical eyes can see. It persuades us to be certain of what we don't see, of what we cannot see. For example, I've never seen a flaming angel or one of the lesser angels with my own physical eyes, but I do see them every day with my eyes of faith. They're everywhere around me, ministering to me, ministering to my family, ministering to this church. In fact, they're ministering to all those who are God's elect children. Can I get more into that? But before moving on to verse 2, then it's important I, that I quickly recap what I've covered here so far. Faith, my friends, brings a dynamic dual certainty to everyday life. First, there's a future certainty that what will come also becomes present to us. Second, there's a visual certainty of seeing what's not seen or the invisible. So here is the possibility that we must consider if we're serious about following Christ. If you're serious about following Christ. It's possible to, it's possible by faith to live in future certitude. To be present at Christ's return, to be present at our resurrection and glorification, to be present in heaven and to reign with him. However, it's also possible by faith to live in visual certitude, in the supernatural, to see all the mountain flaming with light, to see the traffic between heaven and earth in our behalf. This is what our passage is calling us to do. Just as Abraham, by faith, put his stock in the future heavenly country, and just as Moses saw him who was invisible, who is invisible, which we'll get more into as we get deeper into this chapter. The unsaved world doesn't, nor will it, understand true biblical faith. See, many in the world see faith the same way one cynical editor defined it. Illogical belief in the occurrence of the impossible. The thing is, the world fa fails to realize that faith is only as good as its object. 
and the object of our faith is God. See, faith isn't some feeling that we manufacture. It's our total response to what God has revealed in his word. So now after giving us a description of faith in verse 1, the writer now calls to mind faith's activism in verse 2. For by this our ancestors were approved. Every single Jewish forefather that received divine commendation received it because of the character of their faith. This certainty produced a dynamic activism. It moved them to act. And that's what I mean by dynamic activism. In case you need an example, think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had nothing but God's word to rest on and not, had no visible evidence that they'd be delivered in this life. But they knew they would ultimately be delivered. They knew it so well that it was a present reality. In that story, there's no evidence that any of them had ever seen the invisible world at work around them. But they did see it by faith and were certain, by, and, and were certain of it. Their faith consisted simply in taking God at his word and living their lives accordingly. Things that were to come, as far as their experience went, were present to their faith. Things unseen were visible to their individual eyes of faith. And the same goes for every single example that we'll be reading about in this chapter. All the characters that will be mentioned receive their approval because they exercise faith. Or, in other words, they had dynamic activism. Paul makes the same point in Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. I won't read all those verses, but there he tells us that Abraham was counted righteous before God because of his faith. These passages here demonstrate the consistent and clear New Testament teaching that the redeemed of, from Israel who lived before the death and resurrection of Christ were saved because they trusted God to be faithful to his promises. Their faith, my friends, were a, was a messianic faith. They had the assurance that they invested in the promises. They had an, an assurance that they had invested in the promises of God. They hoped in things yet unseen, in a deliverer, that had been promised, but had not yet come. Beautiful is that. So now let's continue reading here. Let's pick up in verse 3. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his, through, through his faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away, and so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. Now, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Since the one who draws near to him 
must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place that he was going to receive an inheritance. He went out even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age, since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. Therefore, from one man, in fact, from one as good as dead, came offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and as innumerable, innumerable as the grains of sand along the seashore. Here now, what we just read, in the beginning of verse 3, the author, the author starts to explain the characteristics of faith by giving us several examples. Starting at the beginning, starting all the way from the beginning, he states that by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. Here, the author indicates that just as we begin our Christian lives by faith, we also embrace the Christian worldview through faith in the word of God. In other words, we believe God's word. We believe what God says in his word to be true. Now, yes, none of us were there to witness creation, and we certainly weren't there to experience it. Only God was there. And only he tells us how that happened, how it happened. However, with this information, we can either choose to believe him or choose to reject him and call him a liar. But by believing his word, we affirm, as believers, we affirm that God indeed created the universe. See, by faith, we must accept it as true, as true, because God doesn't lie. And scripture affirms that everything exists to display God's glory. We believe and know this by faith. Now, after verse 3, the remainder of this chapter is devoted to a summary of the lives and labors of great men and women of faith found in the Old Testament. In each instance, in each one of those examples, you'll find the same elements of faith. God spoke to them through his word. Their inner selves were stirred in different ways. They obeyed God. He bore witness about them. Now, from Genesis chapter 4, there were, we learned that by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. And Cain became enraged at God's acceptance of his brother's sacrifice. And what did he do to him? When he became enraged, he killed Abel. The final statement, even though he's dead, he still speaks through his faith, is both tremendously interesting and encouraging, my friends. See, think about it this way. 
What will be said at your funeral? What words are going to make up the content of your eulogy? How will your life be summarized in 15 minutes of reflection? Hopefully, and this is my prayer, that we all will leave the type of testimony left by Abel. Though he was dead, his life bore witness to the grace and mercy found only in a substitutionary sacrifice. As Christians, we should aspire to leave behind a legacy of faith, not a legacy of accomplishments, not a legacy of wealth, not a legacy of anything that the world considers important. No, we should leave behind a legacy of faith. We ought to leave a wealth of material that testifies to the saving power of Jesus Christ, just as Abel did. And like Abel, our faith ought to be a testimony to the greatness of Christ, even beyond the extent of this life. From Genesis chapter 5, here in Hebrews, we're told that by faith Enoch was taken away, so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. When it comes to Enoch, not really much is known. We almost know nothing about him and the extraordinary event that ended his life. The only other time the Old Testament, in the Old Testament where something similar happens, and I mentioned this, was with the case of Elijah. The author does, however, tell us something important about Enoch. The miraculous end to his life here on earth was the result of his faith. Enoch's faith honored God. Thus, God commended Enoch so that he did not experience death. See, faith honors God. And God honors faith. I encourage you to write that in the side of your Bible. Faith honors God and God honors faith. Enoch is the prime example of this reality. His faith was, ple was a pleasing aroma before God. Wouldn't you like to be... Wouldn't you like your faith to have that same pleasing aroma before God? That it just pleases Him? That He is just overjoyed by it? Think of the best smelling candle or aroma or incense or, or bathroom spray. Or whatever it is, you know, that you just love smelling. Your faith... What it does, it's, it goes up to the, to the Lord, it goes up to God, and he just enjoys smelling it. He enjoys the aroma of your faith, and, he, and he's pleased with it. So moving on, from Genesis chapters 6 and 7, we're told that uh, Noah took to heart the warning about a flood that was not yet seen. That hadn't yet happened. Noah's faith involved the whole person. His mind was warned of God. His heart was moved with fear. And his will acted on what God told him. Since nobody at that time had ever seen a flood or perhaps even a rainstorm, Noah's actions must have generated a great deal of interest, interest, interest and probably ridicule as well. 
Noah, what are you building over there? A boat? For what? A flood? Water? What is that? You're, man, you're crazy. You really believe that's going to happen? You really believe it's going to rain that much where everything's going to flood and this boat's going to carry you away? Carry, man, carry you away? You need a psychologist. You need some help. You're absolutely crazy. The story says that Noah's faith influenced his whole family. And as a result, they were all saved. But he, it, it also condemned the whole world for his faith revealed their unbelief. Now, in the last part of verse 6, the writer says, the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. See, faith is that which unites us to the blessings of God. It trusts in the promises of God and recognizes, recognizes that he's not a greedy miser. God is a gracious giver, a rewarder of those who trust in His goodness. This clause makes two primary affirmations. First, we must accept the existence of God by faith. And second, we accept the promises of God by faith. Now, of course, to say that we accept the existence of God by faith is not to claim that we accept the reality of God's existence against reason as the history of theology and philosophy has shown there are many good reasons to believe in the existence of god and even more reasons not to be an atheist some of the best and most time-tested arguments for theism are what we call the classical proofs for god's existence and yet the author of Hebrews reminds us that the ultimate reason we accept the existence of God is because we believe that he has revealed himself in Jesus Christ and that he has spoken in Scripture. The second assertion that he rewards those who seek him reminds us of the grace of the gospel God is a rewarder because he gives grace and mercy to those who trust in his promises. In the gospel, God makes promises of salvation and declarations about the goodness of his character. So when we trust, when you trust in those promises and believe those declaration, he fulfills his wor word and rewards us with his kindness. Church, what a glorious truth. So how does one enjoy the blessings of God? How do you, how can you enjoy the blessings of God? By believing that God will make good on his word to shower us with grace if we come to him with the empty hands of faith. From there, he gives us a story from Genesis chapter 12. We're told that convinced, convinced by faith about a place that he would someday receive, Abraham left home before knowing the location of that place. Now, after arriving in it, by faith, he lived for decades in the land of promise, waiting for the Lord to give him land. From Genesis chapter 21, by faith in divine fidelity, his wife Sarah, though barren, received the ability to conceive. Consequently, from this 
elderly, impotent couple came offspring as numerous as the stars of the heaven. Now the emphasis of this section is on the promise of God and his plans for the nation of Israel. As we just saw, the nation began with the call of Abraham. Yes, God promised Abraham and Sarah a son, but they had to wait 25 years, 25 years for the fulfillment of that promise. Maybe some of you have been given a specific promise from God. Maybe God has promised you specifically that your children will have a close relationship with him. Maybe he's promised you that your husband will stop drinking that he will stop doing drugs, or your wife. Like Abraham and Sarah, are you holding on to those promises, and are you willing to wait however long it takes? Again, they waited 25 years for that fulfillment was, for God fulfilled that promise. Are you willing to t- wait as long as it takes. Again, God has a perfect timing for everything. Has God promised you maybe also the same thing? Like, you know, one day I'm going to bless you and you're going to have children. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. Don't give up on it. He will fulfill that promise because he's God. Again, just accept it, however long it takes. If you're like me, waiting is one of the most difficult disciplines of life. Yet true faith is able to wait for the fulfillment of God's promise or God's purposes in God's time. True faith is able to wait for the fulfillment of God's purposes in God's time. Let that also sink in. But while we're waiting, we must also be obeying. Again, verse 8 says that by faith, Abraham obeyed. He obeyed when he did not know where he was going. He lived in tents because he was a stranger and pilgrim in the world and had to be ready to move whenever God spoke. Christians today are also strangers and pilgrims. Peter tells us this in 1 Peter chapter 1 and 1 Peter chapter 2. He tells us that we're pilgrims. Abraham had his eyes on the heavenly city and lived in the future tense. He also obeyed when he did not know how God's will would be accomplished. Both Abraham and Sarah were too old to have children, way too old. Talking about 100 years old, over, excuse me, over 100 years old. Yet, they both believed that God would do the miracle. See, unbelief asks, how can this be? Faith, however, asks, how shall this be? Abraham believed and obeyed God when he did not know when God would fulfill his promises. None of the patriarchs, saw the complete fulfillment of God's promise, but they saw it from afar. They saw it from a distance. They saw what God was doing 
from a far, far distance. Dr. George Morrison, a great Scottish preacher, once said, The important thing is not what we live in, but what we look for. Abraham believed and he obeyed. And God fulfilled his promise and God commended him. And because of that, he's mentioned here now in this hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. All right, let's read our last section for, that we're going to be covering today. These all died in faith. Although they had not received the things that were promised, but they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on earth. Now those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they're thinking about where they came from, they would have had an opportunity to return. But they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, to be clear, verse 13 takes us back as far as Abel in verse 4, as Abel in verse 4. But every one of those listed here in this chapter, they died in faith. They lived trusting in God to keep his promises, and died according to those promises. They saw the promises of God, but did not see them fulfilled. Abraham died before seeing the children of Israel march into the promised land. But he died in faith. It's one thing to live in faith, but it's an entirely different, th different thing to be facing your own death and still trust God to fulfill his promises. This is exactly what the patriarch, the pa this is exactly what the patriarchs listed in this chapter did. They saw God's power and faithfulness with eyes of faith, and, th and thus they saw what their physical eyes never saw God's future fulfillment of his promises. They knew God was faithful, so they never stopped believing. The author describes their journey of faith in terms of a pilgrimage to a city. As the patriarchs got closer, they saw the city glow. But they never knew they were not going to make it there in their lifetimes. And still, they endured in their faith, having confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. May this example, my Christian brothers and sisters, not be wasted on us. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, that our, our citizenship is in heaven. And in Ephesians chapter 2, nine, verse 19, he also said, You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Christian, be encouraged by the fact that we're supernaturalized citizens. And our citizenship isn't only with one another, but it's rooted in heaven. Paul again alludes to this reality when he said this in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then, then you will also appear with him in glory. Pro 
brothers and sisters, know this. Understand this. When you're willing to do what is great, it will enable a life of faith. When you're willing to do what is great, it will enable a life of faith. And so what will be the result? Well, our text beautifully answers it in verse 16. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. See, because the patriarchs believed God's word with dynamic certitude, because when God called Abraham to leave Ur, he believed and obeyed, because aged Abraham believed God when he said he would be a father, God is not ashamed to be called their God. In fact, God later proclaimed to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, I am, this is the present tense here, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Not, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, but I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No higher tribute could be paid to any mortal. But God proudly claims that whoever trusts and obeys him, they can humbly insert their name in the divine proclamation I am the God of Chris. I am the God of Robin. I am the God of, Sa God of Sam, of, you know, Bella and Heather and Sam and, you know, all of you. I am the God of Angel. Just after the turn of the century, pioneer missionary Henry C. Morrison was returning to New York after 40 years in Africa. That same boat also bore home the wildly popular President Theodore Roosevelt. As they entered New York Harbor, the president was greeted with a huge fanfare. Morrison felt rather dejected. After all, he had spent four decades, 40 years in the Lord's service as a missionary. But then a small voice came to Morrison saying, Henry, you're not home yet. And was the voice ever right? For God had prepared a city far greater than the Big Apple for Henry Morrison. God says, I am the God of Henry C. Morrison. And here, Henry are the keys to the city. With faith, my friends, it's possible to please God. As exiles and strangers on earth, the patriarchs and ultimately all those who endure in the faith were seeking a different city. This is exactly what Peter says of Christians when he calls them those chosen, living as exiles in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, and strangers in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Paul echoes this, sen this sentiment when he tells us that our citizenship is in heaven. So like the saints of old, we long for a home that is heavenly. Is that what you long for? Is that what you desire, that heavenly home? Well, it's possible. It's possible for you to have it, for, you to, for God to give it to you, for you to receive it. You just have to have that faith, and that faith can only come by believing in what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you. by confessing Him as Lord and Savior. And if you would like to do that, if you would like 
to please him and you've never, have never opened your heart to him. You've never had this kind of faith. I want to invite you to the cross. So if that's what you want and you're ready to be forgiven of all your sins and receive eternal life, I want you to pray this prayer with all your heart and with all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And now, now I ask you to forgive me. I believe that you died for my sins. And that three days later, you rose from the dead. I repent of my sins. I turn away from them. And I now confess you. I verbally confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.